So we're honored to have with us, and we're going to learn more about his story. So let's please join me in welcoming Daniel Mayer. Hello, Dan. How are you today? Hey, good evening. How are you? I am good. It's awesome. been quite some time. Actually, Dan has been my online associate for the past eight years. It's been a while. Yes. And, yeah, it's an honor to be with him today. Thank you. It's my pleasure as well. It's always great to talk about virtual staffing. And of course, I love the Philippines. So anything I can do to help inspire uh, Filipino VAs, people wanting to be a VA, happy to talk about it. Yeah, thank you so much. So Dan, tell me about your story. So um, it's really not your, your typical story. Uh, I think, you know, everyone's got a very unique story. But in my case, you know, it, it started out with my plans of being a teacher. And I went to college to be a teacher and, and thought that would be the path I would take. And I was actually went to college, got a, a, a master's degree in education, was teaching at a college in California. And um, the uh, school went bankrupt mid-year, unfortunately. So I lost my job and I had to find a job to pay the bills. So I took a job with Wells Fargo Bank, one of the biggest banks in the US, um, thinking it would be temporary. And 15 years later, I left Wells Fargo. So Basically, I ended up working in the corporate world. Um, it wasn't my plan, but I learned that I had a skill. When I was at Wells Fargo, I learned that I was really good with data, taking data and using data to be able to help you know, decision makers make good decisions, to make sense of the numbers. And so I kept you know, getting promotions in the bank and doing really cool stuff and getting involved in a lot, of, a lot of projects. And towards the end, I got involved in a project that took me to the Philippines. Um, we were doing some, some outsourcing of some of our data analysis work to um, all, all along, actually, to Genpak and all along. And um, so I went there to do some training. And when I was in the Philippines back in 2011, I realized, you know what? I just love it here. I'm going to set up a business here. So I quit Wells Fargo, moved my family across the ocean, and set up my first business in the Philippines. And so my goal was to really do data analytics training for all of the call centers in the Philippines. And I've pretty much done that. I've done, uh, I think last time we counted, over 8,000 analysts I've trained. Um, for over 150 companies. Um, so pretty much every big BPO company in the Philippines, if they have analysts, I probably train them. And so I did that for a lot of the last, what, eight, nine years now. And uh, as I was doing that, um, doing virtual, uh, doing a lot of my work virtually, you know, I had an office, but I spent a lot of time working on the road. I was traveling a lot. So um, I had a couple of virtual assistants that were helping me promote my business. And as we grew my business, I realized that maybe I should offer, offer virtual staffing as a product. And about the same time, a friend of a friend asked me to help him set up a virtual team of six people to do some back office work, some graphic design, some basic SEO keywording. And um, within a year and a half, that six went to 100. So I, I added over 100 virtual staff for a couple different clients. And that's where I'm at now. I have the virtual staffing business where I have about 25 clients here in the U.S., um, and I have about 100 employees across mostly the Philippines, but also some here in the US supporting that. So I know about data. I know about how to use data to make decisions. I know how to do that virtually. So that's really my story. It's all about being the nerd, um, loving the data, but showing people how to not only use data, but virtual staffing to grow their business. Wow, that's great. So are there challenges that you had or you're having right now in staffing, especially here in the Philippines? You know, it's funny. I, I have had a couple, you know, um, uh, little minor uh, hiccups this week, I will call them, because you know, I've been doing virtual staffing with primarily from Filipino virtual VAs um, since 2012. And almost all of them have been fantastic. In fact, I have a core team of, of VAs, about uh, 20 that have been with me since 2013. So um, we're very consistent in what we do. We provide our, a very quality service to our clients. And um, that consistency is the key. The challenge is finding other people and other clients. So both the client and the employee who can deliver consistently. Right. So um, one of the challenges I've had this last couple of weeks, a couple of hiccups I've had. So I had a couple of people that wanted to be a virtual assistant, but weren't able to deliver the consistency the client needs. And that caused a little bit of, of consternation on, on both the VA and, and the uh, employee's part like, and the uh, 
client's part. So that consistency is what I think is the challenge right now because there's so many people that are working from home, so many for the first time, so many trying to figure out how to uh, help other businesses. That is a, is a big learning curve out there. And even veteran VAs, people who have been doing it for a while, they're finding that they're dealing with a lot more clients that don't have a lot of experience working with VAs because they're now doing all their business virtually. So it's, it's really a, a big area, area of change. And it really boils down to people trying to figure out how to be more consistent. Oh, I see. But I know that still your business is the top analytics brand in the Philippines. So how did you make it? How did you build it to be the top analytics brand in the Philippines? Well, there are two really two things behind that. And um, first and foremost, I have a great team. You know, so I couldn't have done it myself, right? So I mentioned the first thing I did is hire a couple of virtual staff when I first got to the Philippines back in January 2012. And the, um, the idea was that to scale a business, you have to surround yourself with people that can help you do it. So um, that's number one, right? So to become the top brand in analytics training in the Philippines, it required me to invest a lot of time and energy into finding good people, training them, bringing them into my vision so they could actually you know, grow the business like myself. And I've had a couple that have been with me, like I said, since the beginning. And the two of them, Jen and Bam, they've done amazing work to be able to grow my company to be um, our company, not just my company, but our company. And we've made a lot of, of um, success. We've had a lot of, of opportunities to train people. Like I mentioned, over 8,000 Filipinos um, I've trained in analytics and I've taught in a couple of schools. I taught a class at De La Salle a couple of years ago. I mean, so... Um, the, the branding all happens because you have people that believe in you and can help you grow it. And then the second piece of it is the data, right? You have to know where the data takes you. You have to look at opportunity and assess it based on data and make sure you're making good, valid decisions and make course corrections when the data tells you to. So when I went to the Philippines to set up my business, the opportunity was huge because there wasn't anybody doing what I did. When I started in 2012, you type in the word analytics in like, you know, Job Street PH. And you'd see a couple, you know, a couple dozen jobs. But within a couple of years, that couple dozen jobs went to thousands of jobs. There are, if you go to Job Street Peach right now and type in data analysis or analytics, you're going to see thousands of job postings because the, the need for people to understand how to use data has this mushroom. And I saw that before it was a big deal and got there early, was able to turn that into a, a good company. So it's people and it's data. You have those two things, you're going to be successful in business. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Actually, that was in 2012 when I first met you online. <laughs> and you were really uh, the starter in that industry. Yeah. So you're doing a great job. You're the pioneer. So I know yeah, that. I, I, it's, to the best of my knowledge, I think I'm the first, right? I, there are a yeah. couple other companies out there that have been doing analytics in the Philippines, um, but not with the sole goal of really trying to train up the BPO industry. Um, you know, it's, it's been, I've had the, the privilege of uh, testifying in front of the Philippine Senate. I've been involved in a couple um, huge uh, efforts to really upscale the BPO workforce to have, be able to offer more analytics as a service. Um, I've made some wonderful connections across all levels of the Philippines. I've traveled all across the country. I've been to over a dozen provinces, um, pretty much every one for the reason to be able to speak about analytics or to do something when it comes to to trying to help the Philippines become the analytics hub of Asia. Yeah, that's amazing. You're really doing great. So Thank you're not you. only an entrepreneur, you're, you have also become a coach. So what made you decide to become a coach? Well, I, I, I mentioned in the beginning of my story, I started as a teacher, right? I've always been a teacher at heart. And so to me, coaching um, is teaching. You know, it's a combination of helping people figure out what they can do. So mentoring, you know, helping them self-discover what they can do. And then let them know about tools, keeping them up to date, challenging them to try new things, and then moving that forward. So I've had a lot of interns. I've had, you know, uh, dozens of interns in the Philippines that have been gone on to be great analysts. In fact, my first batch of college graduates or fresh grads in the Philippines that I trained, um, I think we trained something like 12. And within, within a few months, seven of them had found jobs in the BPO industry as analysts. And that was my biggest success story, that first batch. And ever since then, I've been training people to be analysts. And that kind of evolved into coaching. Because once I figured out how the people could do the analytics, the goal then became how to get the decision makers to embrace the use of analytics in their decision making. 
And that was a big challenge because a lot of companies are, were, and still are kind of hesitant to really get into data because they don't understand it. They don't really value it. They go off their gut feel. They go off of what's always worked. And maybe they've been lucky and blessed and, and do really well, but for the most part, they're guessing a lot. And analytics helps you eliminate the guesswork, right? And so helping people figure out how to do that really also was a great thing I learned in the Philippines. Constantly working with business decision makers, with owners and managers to be able to become more data-driven. So from the internship and then from coaching uh, businesses, I developed a coaching business. And now I use that coaching business here in the US to coach business owners here about how to use virtual staffing to free themselves up, to give them more free time, and to do things in their business like social media based on the analytics, based on the data. So I kind of take, I've taken everything I've done in the last 10 years and refolded it and launched a new version of it, which is Sonic VA, which we just launched in January. Um, and that's really for the US market, right? So I have DMAI PH, which is the Philippines name brand in analytics training. Um, I have Sonic Analytics, which is a, a company that I've used across multiple parts of Southeast Asia. I've actually been able to give talks in a couple of different countries like Singapore and Hong Kong. Um, and so basically, you know, everything I've done has brought me to where I'm at now, which is now helping small businesses here in the US during this very tough economic times get tied up with Filipinos who have great rock star ability, but don't have the opportunities to, to really become breadwinners because of the economic crisis in the Philippines. So it's kind of like a perfect match that I've been working on since January. Wow, so you mentioned of the word rock star. Yes. So you can see their VAs from the Philippines rock star. Well, you know, there's a lot of talent, right? You know, I, I always give people a short history lesson if they don't understand it, you know, and I think it's important to always, you know, honor the shared relationship between the Philippines and the US. Um, there's pros and cons on both sides, but the bottom line is America's had a, a huge influence in, in the Philippines and that's paid dividends in the fact that a lot of Filipinos speak an American style English. And that translates really well. That's why you see more call centers in the Philippines than anywhere else in the world. If you're in the US and you call 1-800 whatever for customer service, you have a better than 50% chance of having that call go into the Philippines. Because the Philippines has that background of shared experience in the United States, and because they speak an American style of English, that's why you see it. So in the Philippines, you have this uh, group of a couple million Filipinos who speak an American style English, have worked for American companies like call centers and BPOs, and have a, a good education background, have strong work ethic. So it's a, a deep talent pool one that's very hard to find anywhere else. In fact, it's pretty unique. I think it's the only place to find a talent pool like that. So if you're an American business owner and you're trying to scale your business and you're just too busy to do it yourself and you need someone to help you post some social media, do some lead generation, maybe manage your CRM and your database, um, you need someone that you can give directions to, they can understand you easily, they can communicate to your clients in your name effectively. Um, the Philippines is the best place to find the talent. Um, so it really makes sense. And so I learned that, you know, way back when, when I first went to the Philippines, um, and it's been true ever since, that this is the, really the best place on the planet to go to find quality talent for virtual staffing. Wow, that's amazing. So are there already a lot of uh, businesses in your country that consider virtual staffing? Or there are untouched, untouched industries? Um, Yes and yes. So there are quite a few, but if I had to guess percentage wise, way less than half um, of businesses in the United States have really experimented with trying to use virtual staffing. Um, a lot of them just don't understand how to get started. They don't understand exactly what it can do. They worry that we'll take a lot of time to onboard someone to train somebody. Um, and they're worried that it may not work out. So there's a lot of, of things that, that mentally stop them from exploring virtual staffing. And so whether that be like, you know, a big company trying to outsource an entire call center or a small business owner trying to hire someone just to help them manage their social media, um, it's a big market to keep penetrating. There's a lot of opportunity. However, right now it's a very challenging opportunity because even though there's so much opportunity, people were having trouble economically. And it's only gonna, unfortunately, from my perspective, based on the data, get worse before it gets better. So there's never been a better time to explore virtual staffing, 
um, because it can keep your costs down, because it can give you 24 seven customer service, because it can give you uh, access to talent you couldn't find locally. Um, but it's also a time where you have to be really smart about your money. So on the, on the client side, you, you wanna get it right and you don't wanna make a lot of mistakes. And unfortunately, a lot of the mistakes that have, had happened um, are because there's a lot of people out there that are freelancing or are part of agencies that aren't that good. And in any business, in any country, um, there's good and bad. But in the Philippines, there is a significant number of people that want to be virtual assistants that just don't understand what it means to be successful. And part of my effort is to really uh, work with them to make sure they understand what they're doing. There's two things that a Filipino VA should really, really think about when they start being a virtual assistant for an American anybody, but especially for an American, they're going to give you the keys to their car, to their house, right? They're sharing their passion with you. They decided to set up this business because it's their heart telling them to do that, right? And if you just kind of like go at it halfway and, and don't really take it seriously, it's going to blow up in both your faces, right? So a VA has got to understand that what they're doing is not just taking a job. They're not working at SM. They're not working at Jollibee. It's not some big corporation that can just go get a paycheck from. You're buying into someone's dream. So you have to respect that. And if you respect that, you'll be super successful. Again, most of my VAs have been with me since the beginning because they've bought into the, our clients' dreams. They know what the clients want. They're able to provide the client something that they need, which is to speak in their voice. So the second thing that a, a Filipino VA needs to learn how to do, um, besides really understanding the dream aspect of what they're buying into, is learning the voice of the client, doing things in the name of the client, doing things like the client would do, because the client's hiring you to be an extension of themselves. And so you have to adapt, you have to adjust. Now, on the whole, Filipinos are very adaptable. Um, we see that with Filipinos work basically all over the world's OFWs. We see Filipinos working in cruise ships. We see Filipinos working in the call center industry. So it's a, a good mix um, of, of people, but you have to set your, your um, direction on the right course. And so if you understand that when you sign up to be a VA, you're buying into a client's passion and you're willing to learn their voice, you're going to have a great time. Wow, those are powerful words for VAs. Yes. And, you know, I've seen it and again, you know, I've, I've probably in the 10 years, almost I've been doing this, I've employed probably close to 200 Filipinos myself. Um, and I've, I've set up three different companies in the Philippines. I've trained um, thousands of Filipinos and I've taught classes in a couple of different Filipino universities. Um, so I feel like I have a pretty good idea of what's capable I've also, you know, I'm American. I've had businesses here. I've done business here. I worked in corporate America. So I understand what Americans want. So I understand what Americans want, what Filipinos can do. So that's why I feel like I've, I've become pretty successful being a matchmaker to help the, the American companies find the Filipino talent they need to be able to be more successful. Wow, that's great. So what are, nowadays, what are the top in-demand uh, skills that uh, they should consider working on? Sure. So um, social media is like 90% of it, you know, and, and when I say social media, um, most people think of it as just posting things. And you know what, it doesn't work that way. 90% um, of people think social media is just like post something and that's it, right? It's the engagement. It's what you do before the post, during the post and after the post. It's how you curate your content. It's how you build up your fan base. It's how you engage with people that engage with you. That's where VAs should be spending most of their time. You know, I, like, for example, I have a video that I drop every uh, business day around 10 o'clock um, Pacific time or 10 o'clock uh, Philippines time, 10 PM, excuse me. <clears throat> and uh, basically my goal is to be consistent with that social media message that a YouTube video drops, talks about, you know, a new tool I'm using or my team is using, a new concept, something that people can learn about. We share it on social media, we engage with it, you know, that whole process, we're geared towards not trying to have mass appeal, but appeal to the people that really need it, to our audience. And our target market are small business owners in the US and Filipino VAs. So we know who we're trying to focus on and we concentrate on that and we engage in that environment. 
we don't do this scattershot approach. That's something Filipino VAs have to really understand and get good at. Because if you just go onto social media and post your client's stuff and hope it catches, goes viral, it's going to fail like one, 999,000 out of a million, right? Um, it's only going to work once in a million. Um, to really, really be successful, you have to work at it every day and be consistent with what you do and be active in the post and the pre times when you put something in social media. Besides social media, everything else kind of fits into like anything that can be done in the computer can be outsourced. So um, accounting and bookkeeping are quite common. Uh, things like uh, transcription and um, data entry are common. There's a lot of people doing email management, CRM management, doing newsletters, a lot of graphic designers. Um, probably the second most common thing that's outsourced to the Philippines for VAs is graphic design. Um, so if you don't know Canva, you probably don't know how to do a good VA job, right? So Canva is like the go-to um, graphic design tool. Now, some people can do Adobe stuff and they have invested in it and they're really good graphic designers, which is great, especially if you're working for a corporate client. But most small business owners just want someone who can make some cool videos, some cool images, do some simple stuff. So, you know, understanding how to use Canva, um, understanding how to put things on YouTube, understanding the difference between what to post on Facebook and what to post on Instagram, um, those all help. And so that's what I, I focus a lot of my time on is providing the education and the tools to VAs to really understand that. Like the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll say on this topic is that you want to understand the platform as well, right? So if you're marketing to a Filipino um, in the Philippines, everyone's on Facebook because of free Facebook, right? But not right. everyone can view videos on Facebook in the Philippines because free Facebook, you can't view videos, right? So if you're using Philippine, Facebook in the Philippines, you have to be aware of that. Um, in the US, if you're marketing on Facebook, you're marketing predominantly to people that are either baby boomers or Gen X, right? Millennials and, and Gen Z don't use Facebook as much. In fact, a lot of them have just gotten off Facebook completely. So if your client's market in the US is people that are under 30, and you're spending time pushing things out on Facebook, you're wasting your time, right? You wanna be on Instagram. In the Philippines, again, if you're marketing to a certain audience, you wanna know the audience. Like TikTok is super popular with anybody under you know, 15, 20, especially. So if you're targeting kids, Generation Z, you wanna be doing something that's short, quick videos. So you have to understand the platform. And so for Filipino VAs, you wanna know the demographics, the geographies, the um, generational marketing aspects of what your client is trying to do so you can drive their content through the right platform. Yeah, as I understand, in everything that you do in any platform, we always go back to analytics. <laughs> yes, exactly. It's all about the data, right? So the beauty about social media, and this is kind of what's been revolutionary about social media, is they built in free analytics tools. Mm -hmm. So I don't know at what point it became like a good idea that every application, every social media platform has free tools, um, but it's awesome and it's rarely used. One of the frustrations I come across is that I'll be in a room of small business owners. Say I'll have 30 small business owners here in the US and I'll be you know, giving a talk to them and I'll ask them to raise their hands. Like how many of you have a Facebook business page? And of that 30, almost all of them will raise their hand. They have a Facebook business page. Then I'll ask them, how many of you look at the Facebook insights tab? And no one raises their hand. Right. Facebook insights is like this hidden secret, which is crazy because Facebook insights, if you don't know what it is, it's a tab on your Facebook business page. If you go to the menu on the on the left side of the page, you'll see it. And basically it gives you about 12 different visuals of data based on who is following you, who's engaging with you, who's your audience. Like I always you know, think about this when I, I'm in the Philippines and I'm doing something for my Philippines company, DMAI. Um, we want to make sure our target market is Filipinos who work in call centers, um, Filipinos who probably are senior uh, call center agents or team leads or even you know, supervisors and managers. So the demographic in the Philippines um, for that market is people between the ages of 25 and 40, and they're more women than men, and they're all in the Philippines. So the insights tab for my social media, for my Facebook, for DMAI, it better be showing that I'm having almost 100% market saturation in that target market, which I am, which is part of why I'm successful. 
but you could see if you're not doing that, how far off you could be. Like I was saying before, if, if you are offering something that's for young active professionals, like you say you're offering a, your client's offering a vitamin supplement and it's marketed towards people that are active, have an active lifestyle, exercise, um, it gives them a boost. It's something that's trying to association with people that are really outdoors a lot. If you're marketing that on Facebook, you're wasting your time, right? You should be on Instagram. Um, on the flip side, if you're if you're doing something where you're trying to do women's empowerment for women over 50 or financial uh, investment for people that are thinking about retirement, and it's it's predominantly women that you're trying to target. If you're a female speaker or a female author or a female business owner, and you have a VA working for you, that VA should be on Pinterest, right? You should be posting stuff on Pinterest all the time. So you have to know the demographics behind what you do. And it's all data driven. Right. I agree. It's all data driven. Actually, math was not my favorite subject <laughs> when I was in school. But knowing your numbers, I've learned today that knowing your numbers leads to profit. Exactly. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, there's no, you know, there's no arguing against it. People can try, but it's like arguing, you know, uh, that, you know, I don't know what's a funny thing, like the sky is green or something. I mean, it's like, it's not true. I mean, data helps. Data gives you information you should be using. And, and the, the best lesson I could think of, you know, is that one time I, I was in the Philippines and I was guesting on a radio show and I, I got a call into the radio show from, from a farmer in Baguio asking mm -hmm. how he can use analytics to help his business. And he's like, he didn't know anything about math. He didn't even finish high school. You know, like he's got this, you know, traditional Filipino farmer story. And, you know, I thought about it and I go, you know, you're going to need to be able to have someone around you, maybe one of your children or, you know, someone in the neighborhood, someone that can help you with a computer, you know, or a smartphone at least, and to be able to look at the data. Because if you're a, bit, a farmer in Baguio, you need to know exactly what crops to plant. You need to know exactly what markets to sell to. You need to understand the data so that you're not wasting your time and energy by growing the wrong thing and selling to the wrong marketplace. So even a farmer in Baguio can benefit from analytics. Every business needs to understand their data. Yeah, and you also mentioned of demographics. So even if yes. we know that one social media site is uh, more popular than the other, it can't mean that your industry or your business or your product or services could uh, be successful in that popular social media site, right? Right. And you, you know, you can do multiple ones. You know, one of the other things that a VA can do, a lot of um, small business owners don't have the time to invest in using Hootsuite or HubSpot or any of the aggregators like that, where you can aggregate um, your posts across social media. A lot of them don't know how to automate things like to auto post. So you have things go out at certain times. A lot of them don't know how to set up autoresponders, you know, on their Facebook uh, business page so they can have a chat bot answer a lot of basic questions. These are kind of things that VAs can really help a business owner with, right? So if a VA really understands all the different technical aspects that are out there on social media, they can add a lot of value. Again, most people, when they think of social media, they think it's just posting. Both the employee and the employer think that way. And my job is to challenge both of them to think differently so they can have much more success. Right. In a way, we use the social media to generate leads. So that is yes. the goal, right? Right. And you know, you got to have a, a, um, a funnel on whatever you're doing, right? There's got to be a call to action. Um, one of the biggest challenges with social media is that we tend to post things and we get too busy to follow up. You know, it's like, it's hard to do because like you got people that can look at your stuff 24 seven and you can lose track of things. But every time someone likes your post, if you're posting for your business and you're not following up, what are you doing? Why not? Now, if you can't do it because you're too busy, then pay someone to have do it for you because every time someone likes something you post is a potential business opportunity. Maybe they're not going to buy from you, but maybe they can work from you or maybe they can refer you to somebody or maybe they know somebody, right? So we leave so much opportunity on the table because we don't follow up when people engage us in social media. We wait for that person to inbox us with, I want to buy something from you. And that happens one in a million times. What we're missing is the opportunity to 
have a conversation, to invite people, to encourage people, and to capture their information. I mean, like, reality is we want to do as much lead capture as possible. So if you post something on social media and you don't have a link to something that will do a lead capture, why are you really posting it if it's for business, right? You don't always want to come across as trying to sell. You don't want to always come across as being aggressive, trying to get people's information. But even you got to find subtle ways to do that, right? So every time I talk, every time I give a text opt in, I talk about my website. Even if I'm if I'm told I shouldn't sell, I have to be subtle. I can still mention my website, right? Because it's my company, right? So I find ways to be subtle um, when appropriate to make sure I'm trying to get capture of leads, right? So like if you if you're watching me now and you go to Sonic VA, you can figure out what we do and. You know, if you sign up for our service or inquire, we'll capture your email, which will help us market to you. This is something a VA should be doing with everything they do for a business. If somebody's hiring you to help them grow your business and you're not helping them grow your business with everything you do, then eventually it's not going to work out, right? Um, again, you don't always want to be aggressive. Sometimes you want to be subtle about it, but you should always be thinking about everything you do. How is this going to drive more business to my client, to my employer? Because if they fail, I'm out of a job. That's what a VA should always be thinking. And I'll add one thing to this right now. You know, I've come across a lot of VAs lately, especially I mentioned before, ones that are kind of new trying to, to get into the market. And there's a bit of a mentality among some people that if they don't like it, they'll try something else. And that worked for a long time. And especially if you were a call center agent or worked in the call center industry, it was very much where everything was growing so much that if you didn't like your job, you could hop to another one. Or you could just not work for, save up your money, get your bonus, quit for a few months, and then go back to work when you're ready. That is really not going to work anymore. That kind of thinking is going to doom you in these days because jobs are going to be fewer and fewer. There's going to be a lot of scarcity in the, in the near term when it comes to opportunities. So if you're a VA and you think the client's too hard, or you don't understand her, you don't want to work hard enough to do it, and you think, I'll just find something else tomorrow, you're fooling yourself, right? Opportunity's not going to be there. Like um, it's actually going to be harder and harder to find a good VA job. So I'll just give that advice to anybody out there that thinks, oh, you know, it's easy. I'll just find whatever I want. That's not the case. The best VAs, the ones that are been VAs for a while, the ones that are successful, they, again, going back to consistency, they show up for work every day. They don't play games about, oh, I didn't feel well. I had a fever. I didn't want to work today. I mean, if you're working from home, unless you're dying, you should be able to at least put some hours into the to your job, right? That's the whole benefit of working from home. Now, I'm not saying you have to, you know, do something if you're really sick or your kids are sick. There are times you need time off, which is why you should look for an agency to work for, not be a freelancer. One of the things that I do um, is I found that a lot of Filipino VAs, they start the freelance route and they get taken advantage of. Um, they get underpaid, they get overworked. Um, it's inconsistent. They have, have a lot of challenges with follow-up. Sometimes they get ghosted by the employer and don't get paid. But if you work with an agency like mine, that's not going to happen, right? We vet our clients. We set you on a path to be officially a, to be a home-based um, employee of ours. Just like office-based, you get 13 months salary, you get benefits. After six months, you get a health card. Um, the, the Philippine Senate just passed a law recently affecting this, right? So theoretically, and I know it's gonna take a while for everyone to do this, but theoretically, everyone working from home as a VA in the Philippines has to now report their taxes like if they're working in an office. And if they don't, they're gonna be in violation of this new law, right? So these are things that companies like mine can do for a Filipino VA. We will help you process all your government reporting and do all that, get you signed up for SSS and Phil Health and all that stuff. So it can be something to mitigate any risk you have. But if you're a Filipino VA and you're freelancing, you may love that freedom, but this, the Philippines government is looking to find a way to tax you, to make money off of you, because they know that it's a huge part of the population that's going untaxed right now. So something to think about. Wow, I think, you know, more of Philippine, Philippine laws that we, than we do, because I remember before there was no category under VA. Right, there is now. They just passed a couple months. Like, I think it was like in either June or earlier in July. It was... Um, yeah, it's a big deal because a lot of people are freaking out about it. And especially for businesses that have sent their employees home to work um, or looking to hire more people just as on a um, uh, almost like an endo contract, you know, like they're trying to do things where people will just work for, you know, a few months and let them go. Um, the Philippines government is taking this seriously, you know, and so, like I said, I, I've had a couple of opportunities to speak um, to a couple of different people in the Philippines government about this. And, and I know where they're going with it is that they see that that going forward, 
um, the Philippines is going to become even a bigger hub when it comes to virtual assistance. And it's time for that to come out in the light. It's time for that to be a, reg a regularized industry. Um, there's pros and cons to it. But the bottom line is, you know, the, the pros are that the Filipino government doesn't want the Filipino to be taken advantage of. Um, they want them to get their due um, rights and, and do. Uh, um, so that's part of the reason why, you know, so there's good and bad to it, but it's changing and it's only going to change more. So we got to get used to it. Yeah, I think it's reasonable. It's for our security and safety. So I think uh, the government is also doing a good job with that. Yeah, I, I joke about I have a, a master's degree in Filipino in Philippine business law. Um, I've learned the hard way, you know, I've, I've gone through it all, you know, um, and uh, I feel, you know, like it, it's been a good learning. It's been stressful at times. Like if you were to ask me what's the most stressful thing about doing business in the Philippines, um, it's, you know, trying to register your business is right. not easy, right? It's a, it's a very convoluted process, right? Um, trying to make sure that you're up to date on BIR and Phil Health and all those kind of things are a challenge. So I know what it means, right? What it, to do this kind of stuff. So when I talk about it for a Filipino, um, I've been through it, you know, I, I've lived it myself, it's not easy. And you need someone to help you do that. So again, if you wanna be a freelancer, be a freelancer. But if you want security, long-term stability, you wanna stay within on, in the, the right side of the government, you probably wanna look into working for an agency. I think you're a real Filipino now. Yeah, you know, I've I've spent more time in the Philippines than I have in the U.S. the last ten years. If you if you count the number of days I've been here versus there, there's more there. I, I was supposed to be there actually right now, right? If it wasn't for COVID, I would actually be in the Philippines right now. So, oh, I see. So, uh, I I thank you. We thank you for helping a lot of Filipinos. Uh, it's, you don't have to thank me. It's it's a mutual thing. You know, I I love it. You know, and I, and I think it's you know it's my adopted home. You know, I I feel so comfortable there and. There's just so much about Filipino culture that I love. Um, I miss like going to the malls. Um, there's no malls here in the U.S. There's a couple, a few, but there's there's nothing like Mega Mall, right? Mega Mall to me is like it feels like home when I'm there because I know it so well, um, and uh, I, I miss it. You know, I miss I miss a uh, a lot of the Philippines. I mean, I I make my own Calderetta because I have to, but wow. I miss having really good Calderetta. You know, like and yeah, so you know, it's, they say it's more fun in the Philippines, and I agree. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So with this pandemic, I think a lot of uh, traditional businesses are transitioning to digital yes. business. So I think there will be more demands in yes. the VA industry, yep. right? Yep. And this is where it's going to be tricky because yes, there'll be more demand, but it will also be higher expectations. People will be more they'll have a, a lower threshold for making mistakes. Um, they have to get it right, right? Because if you're, if you're in the US right now, based on some data, 40% of small businesses aren't gonna survive the pandemic, at least 40%. That's like a low number, right? So you're talking um, all the people out there that have set up a small business, um, if they're doing anything at all right now, they're doing it online. And so a lot of restaurants that are surviving have adapted to be able to do home delivery and curbside pickup. They've buffed out their online options, but they're also having to engage in more online marketing for their business. And they're having to really do more customer appreciation and really ensuring their customer satisfaction through online. So they're looking to do more surveys and do more giveaways and do more things that offer their their uh, customers more reasons to come back and, and buy from them, even though they can't go into their physical location. And then you look at other people that, that are doing things like business coaching or training or authors or speakers, their whole way of making money has been turned sideways because now they can't go out in person and do it anymore. They have to do it virtually. So they have to rebrand themselves and redo their entire business structure to do it all online. So any of that stuff requires people to help them do it. Right? It requires quality virtual assistance that can help them do a pivot and change their business model from physical geographic locations to online global locations. And again, that means there's more opportunity, but it also means it's going to be more com competitive. Because one of the things in the Philippines right now is I'm seeing is that there's a significant number of the big call centers in the Philippines that have let go of staff that have released a lot of their call center agents into the job market because the clients are cutting back, because the clients are seeing downturns. I mean, for example, 
the airlines like United Airlines, American Airlines, the big airlines companies, they're cutting like 40% of their staff. Right. And so what that means is they're cutting 40% of people that are working in call centers as well. So like both United and American Airlines have call centers in the Philippines. So 40% of the people that are working for those two airlines in the Philippines are going to be out of a job. So as these call center agents flood the job market, they're going to be thinking they can be a VA. They're going to make a transition from call center agent to virtual assistant, which is traditional. Most v great VAs, um, if you look at the, the um, pedigree of most rock star VAs, including most of my VAs, they used to be call center agents. And they moved from being a call center agent to being a VA primarily because they're work from home moms, right? Mm -hmm. They have young children. They wanted to be able to provide for their children and make income while they're at home. They have a call center experience. That's why they went to become a great VA. But now we have like a million new applicants in the same job market, right? So the competition for VA is going to get tougher. You're going to be going to get up against people that have a lot of, of background that will look good in a resume. So it's, it's, even though it's going to be more opportunity, it's going to be more competitive. Well, actually, a lot of our audience viewers right now are already excited to transition to uh, digital work. Yeah, yeah <laughs> right? well, it's the, you have to. I mean, like, yeah, I, I think about where I was at in January. Um, I had launched Sonic VA in January because a few of my colleagues um, had asked me to help them set up a virtual assistant. I had, didn't plan on doing virtual assistance here in the US on a large scale. It was more of a sideline for me. My primary business was and legs training, right? So um, I've always had VAs that have been doing this for a while, but it's been my sideline. It didn't become my priority until COVID happened. And back in February, I started seeing an opportunity that as more and more people are forced to work from home, they're gonna need people that can work from home. And they're gonna need bosses that want them to work from home. So both on the, on the employer and employee side, you're going to see an uptick. And I got there right in February, started doing a lot of stuff for the business. And I've had a little over 20 clients in the last two months. So um, that's huge growth for a sideline that I didn't plan on doing until January. So it shows the opportunities out there. It's going to keep growing and it's going to be more competitive, but it's going to keep growing. So as long as you're, um, you take your training seriously, as long as you really skill yourself um, with the right tools, as long as you treat your client with respect and you understand your buy into their dream. Um, and as long as you're consistent and you show up every day, you're going to be successful as a VA. It's just a, and if you need help finding the right client, you know, I can help with that. That's part of what I do, right? I, my, my business is all about tying up or matchmaking between clients and VAs. Yeah. So I received some comments here, like they have been trying to find uh, jobs on VA, but they're not successful. And so they're asking how they can find you. So maybe you can tell us where we can find you, your, if you have sure. like a YouTube channel or. Yep. So I'll tell you a couple of different ways to do that. The first is that if you're looking to skill up, if you're a Filipino VA or want to be a VA and you're looking to add skills, I have a YouTube channel. If you just type it, Dan Myers, virtual, um, uh, virtual staffing expert in YouTube. Um, if you type in Dan Meyer, you're going to see three people pop up. Me, a sword swallower, and a baseball player, right? I am not the sword swallower. I'm not the baseball player, right? But if you type in Dan Meyer virtual staffing into YouTube, you're going to see I've recorded over 50 videos since February. Um, most of them are things that will benefit a VA to listen to. I talk about what's better, Trello or Asana. Is it better to build a WordPress or a Wix website? Wow, um, what's the best tool for instant messaging? with clients. What, what's your, what social media platform should a client be using based on the target market of the client? A lot of tools there, right? So you can go there, check it out. A lot of content, I put it out there. Um, it's a teacher in me who loves to teach and I can't teach in the classroom right now, so I'm teaching on YouTube. If you're interested in working for me, I don't currently have any openings. I get a ton of applicants and we've got a, a full team right now, but I am growing. So feel free to submit an application. If you want to go to sonicva.com, you can apply there. Or you can go to our Facebook page. Just type in Sonic VA and you'll come to our Facebook page. You can apply there. Um, and if you just want to reach out to me just to get mentoring or coaching, um, you can do that as well. Um, if I can't do it myself, I can tie you up with one of my team leads. I've got some veteran team leads that know the ins and outs of virtual staffing. And I'm going to give a shout out to one of my, my um, favorite VA experts in the Philippines. Um, it's FVA, Filipino Virtual Assistance. It's a Facebook group. 
It's run by a woman named Jomar. Um, she is like a rock star among rock stars. And so she like it, it has built up this following of like 100,000 Filipino VAs. Um, so if you want to network, look for jobs, learn new skills, check out her site. Um, it definitely will benefit you. But if you want to connect with me, find me on YouTube, look for my company website, find me on Facebook. I'm easy to get a hold of. Um, and we can talk about what you want to do. But again, I can't hire everyone, right? So right. But what I can do is I, I can get, I can give everyone some skills they can use to get hired. So. Wow, your YouTube channel is really, I think you're really doing good with your YouTube channel with those very helpful content. Especially yeah, I just launched it in February. So it's, it's pretty right. new. So, um, you know, I was doing some MLEAK stuff, you know, last year, but I really just kind of rebranded it and launched it in February. And I think we're over 500 subscribers and some of my videos have gotten like, I think one of them's got like 800 views, you know, so I'm not viral. I'm not trying to be viral. My goal is not to have 10,000 views. My goal is to have 800 quality views. So I'm very happy with the fact that the people that are watching what I, what I do, it helps them. It's not for everyone, but for the ones it is for, it's getting to them. And that's what makes me feel good. Yeah, those are really helpful. So then, actually, we have two more questions for you. Those are these are not questions, but we want to ask for your final advice or final mm -hmm. thought. You'd like sure. to share especially to okay with two groups, to those with business or business owners, because we also have viewers here who are U.S. Yes. Based, Filipino U.S. based, Canada based. Yes. They have businesses. And also uh, your final advice to those who are considering freelancing or working as a virtual assistant. Okay. One of the things that I started doing when I was in the Philippines in January, was last time I was there, um, was starting to explore the idea of why do, why do Filipino business owners not hire Filipino VAs? It's like just, it doesn't come across, as a, it doesn't hit the top of their mind, right? Why am I not having more home-based staff? There's a trust issue. There's you know, an issue of wanting to have people where you can see them. I get the cultural things there, but in this new day and age, Filipino entrepreneurs that are embracing virtual staffing are becoming more successful. And you even look at some of the success models of the last few years, some of the Filipino companies that have adopted to uh, being more home-based are, are thriving. And that's really the way to go. So if you're a Filipino and own a business in the Philippines, you should not consider Filipino VAs. They can definitely help you. If you're a Filipino who has a business interest in the US or in Canada, you should definitely be using Filipino VAs. It doesn't make sense not to. Um, and if you're in Canada or the US, you know it, the best thing about having VAs in the Philippines is now technology is at a point where we have the cloud storage, we have the messaging, we have the internet connectivity that um, pretty much everyone should be online if they can be online. So obviously the Philippines still has a lot of people that are, that are unfortunately poor that cannot always be on the internet. But if you are a Filipino who's got a certain you know, educational background, you've had a certain professional experience, um, you probably have as stable internet connection and as good as Wi-Fi and as good as, as cloud storage as anybody in the US. So you know, there are people that have that, so, so you can find them. I mean, there are plans with Smart and with um, Globe that are comparable to anything you would find in the US or Canada. So maybe as a business owner, you have to invest in some of that. Maybe you pay your VA an allowance to let them have the high-speed internet. I actually do that for a lot of my VAs. We pay for their internet allowance. The client actually pays for that. So they have high-speed internet at home. Um, so you can invest a little bit in that and you can have the same quality as having somebody here. Um, and of course, the big difference between having an employee in the Philippines and having an employee in North America it's just sad to say, but it's true. It's just cheaper, right? The cost of a good Filipino VA um, is about a third of what it would cost to find the comparable employee based on education and work experience in the US. And that's just the reality. And, and businesses right now, they need to figure out how to save cost. And if they can save two thirds of an expense on an employee, they, they, they'll be looking at the Philippines. So that said, my last tip to uh, Filipino VAs, people who want to be Filipino VAs, is you have to be proactive. You have to take initiative. You can't wait for things to come to you. This is one of my biggest frustrations, having done so much in the Philippines, having been so involved in training Filipinos and working with Filipinos and being part of Filipino success stories as far as virtual staff. And um, you, the ones that are successful are the ones that take initiative. 
American business culture is by nature uh, makes a lot of assumptions that you know what you're going to do and you're going to do it without having to ask a lot of questions. If you do have a question, then you are supposed to ask for it. This goes against a lot of Filipino, you know, people are polite in the Philippines, people who care about, you know, they want to offend anybody, they want to make sure that they're not interrupting, they want to, you know, there's all that emotion, which American business people don't quite understand. So they need you to be direct and to the point. It may not be easy for you. It's one of these things where a lot of virtual assistants, especially Filipino virtual assistants, you're extroverted when you're outside with your friends, but you're introverted when you're working with your client. And that is really frustrating for you and for the client. So ask a lot of questions, be proactive. I promise you get out of your comfort zone for a couple of weeks, get that initial onboarding period where you understand what the client wants and you guys are in sync and it's going to be awesome. You're going to have a great experience. You're going to be able to be the breadwinner of your family working from home by supporting other people doing some pretty amazing things. But you can't do that if you don't ask questions, if you are too shy. A lot of people say that the shy is not a word that really exists in the US. Um, people say what they mean, they say it up front and they're right about it. And in the Philippines, so many people that I talk to, they're shy to talk to a foreigner. Um, you got to get past that if you want to be successful. Wow. I can say that you are an awesome coach, a rock star coach and a mentor. Yeah, we are so honored and so blessed to have you with us. Thank you. Dan, we My hope pleasure. to have time with you again next time. We have sure. asked a lot of questions here, but I think you'd better you'd better connect with Daniel Mayer yourself. Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah feel free to reach out. Yeah, I'll answer the questions, definitely. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching and joining us. We'll see you again next time. Goodbye. Bye.